so, hello everyone. Do you hear me well? Yes? It's okay? Um, so yeah, today I'm going to, uh, to talk about uh, feeding locusts. Um, so before that, uh, thanks uh, again to the PyCon organizers. Uh, the event is going really well so far, I think. I think. Um, uh, and I want to uh, apologize to you all because uh, given the name of the talk, uh, I really, really wanted uh, to make a live demo, but uh, I didn't find enough time to finish it, so there won't be any live demo, sorry about that. Uh, that being said, uh, I mostly do the talk again somewhere else uh, later, so I will have that demo. Um, so my name is Guillaume Joan. Uh, I'm called Ramnes pretty much everywhere. Uh, so if you want to find me uh, on the internet, uh, ramnes.eu is the place. So there is a link to my LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever. Um, I'm working at Numbly. Uh, so Numbly is a data marketing uh, company. We help our clients to do better marketing. Uh, and for <coughs> that, we use a lot of Python and a lot of other uh, very cool technologies. So as everyone out there, we are recruiting, so feel free to come to me after. Um, and that's it. So um, I want to warn you, there will be a lot of emojis on the next slides, so don't panic. It's OK. So 8.30, Bob's wakes, Bob's wake, Bob wakes up. So who's Bob? We don't, we don't know yet. Bob arrives uh, at the restaurant. Uh, he is the one who takes orders, OK? The first client comes in. So it's a locust, because it's a, re a restaurant that feeds locusts. Uh, and, uh, and everything's all right. At 11, there is a bit more locusts that arrive. Uh, a, a queue starts to form. Uh, so there is a queue of two locusts. Uh, half past 11, uh, there is a lot of locusts coming in. Uh, it, the queue starts to be ve very, very long. So Bob is completely uh, out of the business. But uh, hopefully at 12, uh, his co-workers arrive so they can spread the queue. Uh, and everything is better for Bob. Uh, but at, at half past 12, uh, the queue are completely full. Uh, there is a lot of locusts. So they never stop coming in. Uh, so there is a crisis meeting between Bob and his coworkers. Uh, they really don't know what to do. Uh, but Bob has an idea. Bob uh, wants to use robots. What if, what if they use robots instead of their old computers? Uh, and so they use the robots, uh, and uh, the locusts are served much faster, uh, and the queues start to disappear. So there are, still, there are still more and more and more locusts, but they can be fed. But at, uh, at 1 p.m., yeah, <laughs> uh, there's even more locusts coming in, and, and they are completely overflowed. And the story to be continued. So now I'm going to do my real talk. Uh, so scaling P Python to uh, 1K QPS per server, uh, QPS query per second, not doing all the world. So that's the main part of the talk. It's not doing all the world. Um, I, I really want to uh, to show what's what scaling, uh, what is scaling an application, a real a real use case. So before we start, let's do a quick summary. So uh, in your opinion, who is the locust? Yeah, requests. Yeah, there are web web requests. So yeah, serving clients. Uh, what's the the desk and the computer? Huh? No. It's a CPU. Uh, so Bob is the process. So your your application that you're serving. And the robot can be a lot of things. Uh, we'll see that later. <laughs> so. The first word about scaling is that there is a lot of things to scale. There is a lot of uh, way of scaling. Uh, but there are some ways that are way simpler than others, right? 
So you really should, when you want to scale, you really, really, really should uh, uh, try to keep as simple as possible, uh, because like it's useless to to rewrite everything in C when you can just like fork a process or that kind of stuff. But we'll we'll discuss about it. So the step zero to scale something is to have something to scale, right? So um, here we are going to take the example of uh, TwiPy. TwiPy is a project, I forgot to put the URL, but it's, it's a project made by someone on GitHub that I really found like completely randomly. Uh, I was searching for a project that was uh, not scaled yet, uh, that was uh, a mix of read and writes, uh, uh, like a, a, real, a real website. Uh, and that was uh, not coded like too badly, but not too good neither. <laughs> so uh, that was a perfect use case, a uh, perfect project. Um, so we are going to, to have the, the basic fact that we are running on a four CPU, uh, uh, 16 gig of RAMs. Uh, and that we have uh, uh, Nginx, uh, Nginx uh, reverse proxy in front of uh, our application. So the reverse proxy is just going to take every request coming from uh, port 80 to, uh, to the port uh, 5K. So TwiPy is a little application uh, written in Flask with SQLite. Uh, it uses Flask, SQL Alchemy, Flask, what the forms, uh, Flask Bcrypt. Uh, it's mostly for the live demo, but there is no live demo. <laughs> so what you can do on TwiPy is that you can uh, register, login, log out, uh, list uh, tweets, write new tweets, uh, list all users, uh, follow and unfollow other users. Um, and yeah, when you list tweets, it's not only your tweets, but obviously also the tweets uh, of the people you follow. So that's pretty much it for uh, our uh, applications that we want to scale. So the, te the step one uh, before uh, scaling is to identify threats and define a protocol. So uh, we'll, start, we'll start by, by identifying threats. So it, we can, the, the first thing to do is really to separate uh, the different things you can do on your uh, application. Uh, between reads and writes because uh, you don't scale read and writes the same way. Um, you can do it the same way, but it's not as efficient. So in reads, we have the tweets list, the user list, uh, and in writes, everything else. Then in a second time, we want to, uh, to try to guess in advance uh, what are going to be our uh, hotspots. Uh, so, in our case, since the main goal is to look at other people's tweets and to, uh, and to talk, uh, our two main uh, hotspots are uh, the, tweets, the tweets list and uh, the fact that you can write new tweets. Uh, I've put the, li the tweets list in red because uh, most likely you won't tweet a lot. Uh, when you're on Twitter, you, you read much more than, than what you're tweeting. Uh, uh, I think that I read something that's, that was saying that on Twitter it was like a, a five to one ratio. So you read five, uh, you make five uh, read requests for one write request. Uh, but in our use case, we are going to, to define a, a protocol which is a bit different than this five uh, to one ratio. Uh, so first of all, we have to define rules for uh, our benchmark because if we don't define a rule, we can just like say, okay, I'm going to change that thing. I'm going to spawn uh, 10 servers. Oh, that's case, yeah. Uh, so the first rule is only one server. Uh, so no horizontal scaling. Uh, the response time should stay under two seconds for 95% uh, of the users all the time. Uh, if it goes uh, upper, it's, it's, it's uh, bad. And the failure rate should stay at 0%. We should have like no failure at all. If we have any failure, it means that uh, our, uh, our scaling model is not good. <coughs> so yeah, 
uh, in our case for uh, for uh, for TwiPy, we are going to uh, to define those ratios. Uh, basically, there are weights uh, that we consider to be similar to real life. Uh, so this is a good like. I mean, you can have those uh, those ratios by um, monitoring your application, but sometimes you don't have metrics. Sometimes so. A good first step is to do metrics and to know those ratios for sure. But here we are just like guessing them. So I'm guessing that there is like 10 times more uh, uh, people listing the tweets than people writing new tweets. Uh, and uh, yeah, all the other ratios are like this. And um, so to do your benchmark, you have to use uh, something that allows you to do this. And there is this tool called Locust. And the locust at the beginning, uh, which uh, which allows you to define those weights. So let's uh, run our application with a simple Python run.py, and we have 50 query per second. Great. So we're far away from the 1K, right? So the step two is to parallelize. Honestly, it's like the very basic. It's super simple. Uh, you just have to use something like Unicorn or USG. Uh, Unicorn, uh, it's it's so it's a web server that allows you uh, a web server slash process managers that allows you to run the same application uh, several times. So if you have four CPUs, you might want to run it like uh, four <coughs> processes. Uh, it performs well. It's e it's very easy to configure. Uh, it has good documentation, but it's uh, HTTP only. You can't talk uh, directly to a reverse proxy like Nginx. So there is that uh, other one called uh, USG, which is supposedly, supposedly better uh, at performances than Unicorn. Uh, I didn't verify it. Uh, but it's also much more complete. It's almost Turing complete. Uh, and it's harder to configure. Uh, and documentation is not very good. Uh, but if you take the time to master it, it has a lot of, of uh, advantages. Uh, it can speak with Nginx, uh, natively with uh, mod USG. Uh, it has great advanced option. Uh, it has like auto scaling, uh, a, queu a queuing system, a spawning system, a cache system. So it's really a big, big thing, but it's hard to, to master. So in both cases, uh, uh, it's very for our application. If we just want to run four processes and four CPUs, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to just consider USG because this is what I know the best. So in USG, you can uh, write uh, a config file uh, and run it uh, like USG uh, to pi.ini. So it's very straightforward. So by doing this, we go from uh, from uh, 50 Q QPS to uh, to almost 200 QPS because we have four uh, four processes instead of one. Very very simple. The 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 only thing to, to make sure here is that your application is stateless. What we call uh, a stateful application is a, uh, an application that remember previous interaction with users. So for example, that keeps a count of, uh, I don't know, uh, the number of tweets of the user. If the application restarts, then that count will be lost. And also if we have multiple uh, processes of the same application, you won't have any, any consistency between those, uh, those states. So you want to put those states somewhere else, like a database or a cache, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, in our use case with TriPy, uh, it works because uh, we, have flat, we have sessions, but those sessions, flash sessions, are uh, implemented client side. All the data is kept on the cookie of the client, so uh, it makes the application stateless. Uh, whoops. So step three is check your uh, usage of your database. Uh, you really should leverage RAM, uh, which means that, that uh, you should have as much uh, of your uh, data directly in RAM because it's much faster to access and it's pointless to do, uh, to do uh, access into disk, which are much slower if you have a lot of empty RAM. So you should do everything you can to have your RAM almost full. Uh, just just keeping a bit of RAM for your application to run, and for your kernel to work also. Uh, 
also paging. Uh, so paging is very hard. Uh, like, what do you do to uh, navigate from page to page uh, consistently when the data changed a lot? Uh, you can lost the, the count and the index of uh, where you are, so it's very difficult, but it's outside the scope of this talk. Uh, but that being said, uh, you should never return a full set of data. That's pretty obvious, but who knows? So all your database queries should have a limit. Explain. Uh, so all the databases which implements uh, indexes, they all have some sort of uh, an explain feature. Uh, and that explain feature helps you to understand what's happening and if the queries are using the index or not. So use it. And also, almost every DB uh, implements a, tr a, trans a transaction log to keep track of everything that happens. Uh, and you really, really should monitor it for long-running queries. Uh, that way you can, like, even if the code changes, if someone implements a new query well, that's not optimized at all, you can know it and you can, that, I mean, that's the most important thing to monitor in a web application. Uh, so let's say that our application was very bad at querying and we had zero index and that kind of stuff. So we gain uh, another uh, 70 QPS. <coughs> Step four, uh, you should cache <coughs> all the reads you do. Uh, but remember there are only two odd things in computer science, uh, cache and validation and naming things. Uh, so that's a well-known code. Uh, and it's really true. Uh, basically, what we mean by cache and validation is that uh, on a f on a on a function that gets your uh, your data, uh, you first try to get it from cache. If you don't have it from cache, you get it from database. And uh, on, a, on another function, another endpoint uh, that write inside that data. Um, you really want to write and then remove the cache you have previously saved. So this is cache and validation. And this is odd because if your, your cache is uh, spread across uh, several machines or uh, if your cache uh, is, uh, is uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, I don't remember what I wanted to say, but uh, but yeah, yeah, you have to you have to invalidate the cache everywhere uh, where you're writing. So that's making it that's making it hard because if someone writes uh, in some place that you don't know and it forget to invalidate the cache, well, you will have inconsistency. Uh, another way to write the previous example, which I think in Python is much more uh, enjoyable, is to use the decorators uh, and to uh, uh, get the the functions that are cached out. Uh, so this is an example of what you could achieve with uh, a lot of caching libraries. Uh, but you could tell me, hey, uh, Guillaume, the application is stateful, right? No. If you, if you just uh, put the cache inside uh, a dict or something like, uh, your application is stateful. And you, will be, you, you, would, you would be right. Uh, and that's why you really want to use something like memcached which is basically a database uh, in RAM, a very, very simple database, but in RAM, uh, where you can put all your, uh, all your cache, which is really made for that. It has very good performance, is well tested. Uh, you can use also the well-known Redis, uh, which is much more powerful, but a little more complicated. Also, like I said, USG also has this caching system if you don't want to add a, uh, something in your stack. Uh, so yeah, by caching reads, we can like add a uh, hundred QPS uh, on top of that uh, because every every tweets list uh, we have seen that it's the most called endpoint on our use case, so it's going much much faster. Step five. Now we arrive in uh, funny things. So you want to achieve consist uh, concurrency. So what we call concurrency is that your application should never wait anything. Uh, you, shouldn't have, you shouldn't have a process which is idle uh, more than one millisecond or, some, or even one millisecond is huge. Uh, well, it, sh it shouldn't wait at all. Uh, so to do that, uh, there is a mechanism uh, and libraries like uh, G-Event, uh, which allows you to, to add concurrency to uh, 
an existing program. So I'm not talking about uh, Tornado or that kind of thing because uh, they really require uh, the application to be thought for Tornado <coughs> from the beginning. Uh, Jevon, which what's great with Jevon is that you really can take like any application and just put it on top of it, and it just works. Um, uh, and in the future, you really want to use uh, AsyncIO and uh, ESGI. So um, ASGI is basically the equivalent of WSGI, so the, the protocol that Python speaks uh, for a web requests. Uh, but asynchronous, so it's concurrent by default. There is a lot of uh, projects coming in. Uh, on that subject, there is Quart, which is uh, basically a rewrite of Flask uh, in AsyncIO, uh, and that keeps exactly the same uh, API. Uh, UVCorn, which is um, a web server which uh, takes uh, full capacity on uh, AsyncIO. Django does a lot of stuff uh, about uh, asynchronicity. Uh, actually, the ASGI uh, uh, protocol was made by Django guys. Uh, so they have two, two things. They have a thing called Daphne, which is a uh, web server, uh, and channels, which is uh, uh, a lot of things that you can add to Django to do web sockets and that kind of stuff. Uh, and Hypercon, which was uh, at the beginning the web server of Quart, the asynchronous web server of Quart, but which now is a full project on its side. Uh, and that's it. So, yeah, uh, you really want to monitor your application to see. Uh, if it's uh, CPU bound or IO bound. What we say when we say CPU bound or IO bound uh, is basically a process can do two things. It can do either work, so use the CPU and do real work, like uh, for example, calculating a hash to compare password when your user login. Uh, but it can also uh, send the query to a database uh, and just wait for the answer. So when it sends a query to a database, it's input-output. Actually, it's network, but it's some sort of input-output with sockets. Uh, um, and yeah, concurrency is very, very, very interesting uh, when you have a lot of uh, I.O. Uh, tasks. But if, you're, uh, if your uh, uh, requests are mostly based on CPU, it won't be of any use. Um, and uh, database rights, yeah, database rights is really like the first thing you want to make concurrent. So you want to have a concurrent uh, database. For example, SQLite that is used in SwePy is not concurrent. <laughs> so it looks at each request, so it makes it harder. So you have to implement all the concurrency mechanism in the application directly, so it's not good. Uh, but pretty much all like industry database like PostgreSQL, Go, uh, MySQL, MyDB, anything, they, they are uh, pretty concurrent. Uh, so you just have to tell in your application, so every time there is a write, do it uh, on a separate uh, green thread, uh, so a separate lightweight form of thread, and it will, uh, and it will uh, increase your performance a lot. So we end up uh, with that to more than um, 500 QPS. Uh, and uh, we're at step six, but what's step six like? I think we've done pretty much everything, right? So right now our application looks pretty much like this. Uh, there is uh, four CPUs, they are all screaming because of too many requests. Uh, we have cache, we have concurrency, we have uh, everything we can to, to, to make the answer faster. But there is one last resort, which is to scale vertically, right? So just get a better, a better server, uh, either with a better <coughs> CPU or with more, uh, more, more, uh, more CPUs. So for example, if we, if we go from a four CPU to an eight CPU server, well, it works a bit, <coughs> uh, a bit better, and we can get the 1K QPS. Uh, yeah, so as a, as a conclusion, um, don't forget that we live in a finite world, uh, so it's impossible to scale uh, indefinitely. Uh, once you've masked 
uh, out the CPU capacities uh, of your server. Uh, you must enter in the fa fascinating but also very dangerous world uh, of uh, horizontal scaling and distributed systems. Uh, but apart from that, there are uh, four other things that uh, I would like you to retain from this talk. The first thing is when you benchmark, do it with rigor and real use case. Like, I don't like every two weeks in Python, we have a new web framework that say, I'm the fastest web framework. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, <coughs> but most of the time, the web framework is, uh, isn't the bottleneck of your uh, of the stack. So the second point is, uh, Easy improvement can have huge benefits. Uh, keep it really simple, stupid, as much as you can. The third point is that really there is no need to rewrite everything in C, like I said at the beginning. Uh, the most important point is really to know your stack, to know it very well, to tweak it with time, uh, and to leverage its forces, to make it concurrent if you can, to like add some bricks. Uh, uh, that's it. And the last, the last point is that asynchronous programming uh, is by nature, I would say, uh, the best paradigm for, for web programming since the web is some interconnection with a lot of requests on uh, all sides. Uh, by nature, uh, asynchronous programming is, is made for the web, for the web so uh, use it. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.